First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who responded to my previous video. It was really long, and I wouldn't have been surprised if a lot of people didn't follow it to the end. Um, but the central point was um, the whole idea of taboo. Um, and I was trying to find a taboo uh, that is not necessarily universal. Like, the modern Western mind increasingly has a tough time wrapping itself around things like the ritual slaughter of animals. We have, our mindset says you can do anything you want as long as you're not harming some, some thing or someone else. Um, and when you slaughter animals, it would, it would be assumed that, okay, you are harming something else, so a justification is required. Um, killing things is somehow problematic for us, just on a gut level. Um, killing animals, even, is something that we kind of have to justify or um, explain when we're doing it. We can't just walk around killing things just for the heck of it. Now, we I don't think many of us actually think that through, and I'm not saying that we have to. It just seems to be that something very deep in us says being pointlessly violent towards other creatures is wrong, I guess. Now, I mentioned Jung in the previous video who pointed out or held that we have two ways of apprehending the universe. We have the rational way and we have the non-rational way or intuitive way. And that in the totality of what we are, these are at least have equal weight. Our visceral likes and dislikes or aversions and attractions or loves and hates or whatever make up as much of what we are as anything else, uh, as our, the part of us that says 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, this is just, you know, I guess mostly we would call that human imperfection, but I would simply say that's human, human nature, it's the way we are. Um, <clears throat> now that is kind of an assertion, an appeal to authority here, but th that's kind of another subject. Um, Jung is, has just said something, and I'm using his name to bolster sort of case that I'm making, or at least an argument or an experiment I'm engaging in. There do seem to be things that we are opposed to just because we're opposed to them, because they seem to be, in some strange sense, blasphemous, forbidden, whatever. Um, ritual animal slaughter seems to be in that kind of, at least in terms of the human experience, uh, even the present realities of the world, something that bridges that divide for, for the modern Western mind, ritual slaughter of animals, is somewhat taboo. It's just you don't do that. It's, you, I, you shouldn't even have to explain why you don't do it. It's just barbaric, and that's that. Um, that, I think, is a visceral response, and because it's visceral, our sort of over-reliance, or our central reliance, I guess, on reason, uh, says that, well, I'm sorry, that's not enough. You're going to have to justify that logically. Do we really have to justify things like that logically? Um, not based on just a feeling? Try to have the same discussion. I'm sure it's been done out there in YouTube on things like pedophilia or rape or incest or um, slavery or things like this human sacrifice. Um, you would elicit a pile of visceral responses. Like if someone did, had attempted to engage in the same thought experiment, but we're talking about, say, pedophilia, I would have a visceral response, and I would just say, I'm not touching that one. Um, something in my mind would say, forbidden. Now, that, what I'm groping at is, is some sort of um, some sort of affirmation of the occasional visceral response is our non-rational response to things or our non-rational responses to things equally valid to our rational ones. Um, 
we have taboos as a society. Um, right now we're going through a period where any kind of sexual invasion of another human being, as defined by that other human being, is unacceptable and is to be anathematized. Um, and if you try and bring reason into it, or I shouldn't say if you try to bring reason into it, if you try to sort of be clinical and ask people to justify their opposition to things like this, like, what, why shouldn't I be allowed to grope women type thing, if you try and make that kind of a case, you're going to elicit a visceral response. People are going to get upset that you even attempted to do this, even though you're trying to have a rational discussion. Somebody will say, no, you're fooling around here. You're trying to justify your horrible behavior. Which, again, just all you're really doing is you're turning up the heat underneath that person who's talking about that sort of thing. You're not, like, you're sort of isolating that person and denouncing them, saying what you're doing is forbidden. You're challenging the bedrock of all of our thinking. You can't do that. Now, I'm not in interested in doing that with any other subject. As I say, the ritual animal slaughter seems to be in the sort of, I won't say it's in the gray area, but it's, it, it sort of bridges the divide. Because some people, perfectly reasonable people, who are otherwise perfectly normal, um, can engage in this sort of thing. You see a lot of it in, say, Islam or Judaism, or as I've seen in, uh, in certain strains of Hinduism, and I'm sure it's there in Christianity, um, where, well, look, we have to kill animals for food, so we might as well make it as neat, painless, and extraordinary an event as possible, like the whole point of kosher or halal slaughter. At least the way a lot of people explain it is to make sure the animal dies quickly. One swipe of the blade, shoo, there. The animal is dead. None of this um, hacking it to bits while it's still alive. Um, but it is still the ritual slaughter of animals, and some people would say that by sanitizing it that way, you've actually prolonged it. Um, but again, the discussion, the jury, as we shall, you know, as, as we could say, I guess, is still out because a lot of uh, the human race supports the ritual slaughter of animals, and they even see it as a good thing. Um, but a lot of us, increasingly, I would say, the the way things are going is we're questioning this: is this what we should be doing? And I would say the advantages with those who are questioning it, who are questioning things that have always been done that people aren't, haven't challenged. Say, for example, female genital mutilation. Um, I bet that a lot of people who engaged in that for centuries, millennia, or whatever, never really questioned it. Um, they did it to their daughters, and, well, I'm just trying to make sure she has a good marriage. A you know, decent man will marry a woman who has the possibility of becoming promiscuous and making his life miserable and wrecking his honor and that sort of thing. So if everyone knows that I've put a restraint on my daughter, she'll get a husband. Isn't that the main thing that women are supposed to look for in life? This is a terribly uncertain existence and nothing is better for a woman than a good, attentive, respectful husband. And this is how we get her one. Um, but now we're appealing to the potential good, respectful, attentive husband, and saying, do you really want that? Is that really what makes a woman attractive to you? That we've castrated her in that way? Um, and, oh yeah, you know, I, I, you see this happening, I'm sure, or I can imagine it happening throughout a lot of the Islamic world where it takes place. It just... It doesn't take place in a lot of the Islamic world, but in those bits where it does take place, and it takes place in the non-Islamic world as well, people are just sort of, I don't know, in a sense, waking up from a dream. Why, why are we doing this? Um, I can see things like bullfighting going the same way. People are just asking themselves, instead of just being sort of militantly, adamantly opposed to it, they're just saying, why should we do this? And I don't see anything wrong with that.
instead of just sort of having a visceral hatred of this act, we're just questioning it. What's the point? Now, in, in, in a sense, that's kind of loosening the taboo-ness of the whole thing. You're not really saying that we must avoid something because it's horrific, although it's kind of headed in that general direction, say the female genital mutilation thing. I can see within, say, 20, 50 years, the entire planet will probably agree that ge female genital mutilation was a horrible thing that should never have happened in the first place, and we will not entertain any circumstances under which it can be allowed. I'd be all for that. Why not? Uh, can I explain rationally why? Not necessarily, but who says that I have to be rational about it? Um, there's that dichotomy, right? I apprehend things rationally, I apprehend them non-rationally. Or intuitively. Intuitively, I think, uh, doesn't that ruin what attracts me to a woman in the first place? It's not, not her sexuality, but it's the fact that she simply is what she is. Females attract me. Having a clitoris and having a, a sex drive and all this sort of thing is part and parcel of what I what attracts me to a woman in the first place. Love. Instead of being horrified by female genital mutilation, I would sort of expect that a, not, a better response is to say, I don't want to do that to those whom I love. Um, instead of anathematizing things, you make it sort of superfluous. But love, you see, is not really a rational response, so we can't really use that as an argument. I'm saying that we can, but we don't do it because, again, we over-rely on reason. Um, but again, what we've got to do in that circumstance is to allow for intuitive arguments, um, which, well, uh, how do you do that? How do you do that in the modern discourse? We can't have intuitive arguments, not so much against bad things, as we can have intuitive arguments to obviate these things ever arising. Instead of being opposed to the ritual slaughter of animals, in this case, how about, I love animals and I don't want to harm them. Um, instead of, I'm angry at the fact that this is happening. Um, in, in that sense, you are saying, yes, the intuitive, the visceral, the emotional, the sublogical is just as valid as the rational, but you're not throwing, you're not saying that just because something is irrational, it is then valid the same way that we say, or non-rational, I guess, or intuitive, the same way that we kind of say, if it's logical, if it's based on reason, it is valid. How about it is based on an intuitive approach to things that makes it valid. If it's based upon love, it is just as valid as if it's based upon reason. Um, why would I want to say, you know, any of these taboos that I've come up with, you could say murder, you could say um, uh, deliberate cruelty to animals, or um, acts of sadism, or acts of random violence, or just, you know, the way that a lot of that kind of apocalypse now type thinking that sort of shocked us all back in the 70s. It says they, they were questioning, why should we be nice? The purpose of existence is to survive and to subjugate other things. And whoever survives, whoever prevails in this slaughter that we call human existence is the only one ultimately that, quote unquote, deserves to live. Um, because look at the way the animal kingdom works. Look at how it is. The lion's on top, or the tiger, or the shark, or whatever, because it is stronger, and that's the end of it. The law of the jungle has no morality, so we must live by the law of the jungle. 
No. I disagree with that point of view because, again, it, there is, in a strange sense, an over-reliance on reason. As I said in you know, one of my favorite lines from that movie, Apocalypse Now, even the jungle wanted him dead. The jungle wanted Walter Kurtz dead because he was kind of blaspheming against what the jungle really is. The jungle is not, it doesn't promote the strong and stamp on the faces of the weak. Jungle's neutral, it just is. Um, it doesn't favor or disfavor anyone, or anything, or any being. It doesn't promote the survival of the fittest. It just, that's how it works, that's all. So if you over-rely, I would say, on reason, you run into these situations where you can't really justify your opposition to certain things. Like, if you've ever seen the series Rome, um, there are a lot of glaring inaccuracies in it. I'm kind of a classics nerd, ancient Greece and Rome, but they got a lot of stuff right. And a lot, one of the interesting points that they always subtly introduced was the idea of power. If you're in a position of power, the people believe beneath you are irrelevant. It doesn't matter. They're just so much clay with which you can play to form all things that sort of create a scaffolding for your own existence. If you're strong enough, you use those who are weaker than you. And that's it. It's a terrifying sort of world to look into from a modern perspective. But in other ways, it's fascinating because you're stepping into, you know, terra incognita in many ways. Like um, Titus Pullo, who is the big goofy, uh, um, kind of affable, even likable Roman soldier. He's also a violent brute who has no scruples about uh, beating up women or killing anyone who displeases him. Uh, but he also has a sense of decency in him, and he does care about other people, and he cares about them in a completely visceral, sublogical way. He's perfectly capable of very profound love at the same moment as he's perfectly capable of losing his cool and murdering somebody just because he lost his cool. Um, <clears throat> and he doesn't really care much about, um, about torture or anything like that. Uh, he's asked to torture somebody in one scene. He goes, I, I don't know how to do that. They have experts. I, 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 ne I never occurred to me how to torture somebody. It wasn't, oh my God, torture somebody? It's just like, I, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, again, his sort of, the good in him, if you want to call it that, I would say the love in him. And remember, he's just a TV character, right? But he's there to illustrate a point. The love in him sort of filed the horribly rough edges off of what was otherwise a brute. And he lived in a brutal existence. The Roman ethical system had nothing against cruelty per se. There was no idea that, well, you can't be cruel to people because it's wrong to do that to them. It's just the thinking was it's wrong for you. Like, what kind of a person do you turn into when you torture people all the time? You're, you become utterly corrupted by that. It degrades you. It destroys you. It's the same thing as, as I say, a guy who drinks a vat of wine every day. Look what happens to you over time when you do this. Um, and I think that in many ways that's a healthier way of, or, or not justifying, but approaching our taboos. It's not so much that we have no right to do this to these, if you want to say, victims of our more horrifying impulses, our impulse towards violence, our impulse towards sexual violent aggression, our impulse towards um, horrifying other people, disturbing them, and, and uh, this sort of thing, power, our impulse towards all of this. It's not that this is in itself bad because it's bad for other people. It's bad for us, if not managed properly. Why? Well, it's hard to say, but it does seem to hold out that in a more or less intuitive sense, but in a solidly intuitive sense, we disagree with things like, for example, pedophilia. We say, no, very few societies, although it does exist, of course, but very few societies think that pedophilia is acceptable. 
the only circumstances under which it is sort of ignorable is if you've <coughs> kind of based your assumptions on the idea that people at the bottom of the social heat are fair game for whatever we want to do to them or with them. Um, again, that was the thinking in ancient Rome. If you're a slave and you don't have the guts to fight to the death to protect yourself, even as a helpless animal or child or whatever, tough luck, you deserve whatever you get. A wolverine won't just sit there and let me cut its throat the way a cow will. Even though, even if a wolverine has absolutely no way of defending itself, really, realistically, against my superior firepower, I'm, I'm not going to be able to just walk up to a wolverine and slit its throat the same way I can do it to a cow or a, or a sheep or something like that. Um, therefore, the wolverine kind of has my, expect, my, my respect. Same thing with, you know, a tiger. I can't just walk up to a tiger. The tiger will fight to the death to prevent me from doing this. A sheep won't. So, well, I have no respect for the sheep. It won't even lift a finger in its own defense. The tiger will. I respect that tiger. That's kind of the, the Roman attitude. Um, it kind of reminds me of a scene from the bridge on the River Kwai where the commandant of the Japanese prisoner of war camp was absolutely contemptuous of his prisoners. He thought they were so much garbage. And he just just didn't care what became of any of them. And if his men wanted to beat them all up and brutalize them and everything, well, too bad. They're not even going to resist. But when a couple of them ran off into the jungle and, you know, were caught and, you know, even overpowered, I think they might have even killed some of the Japanese captors. These escaped prisoners got the respect of the Japanese commandant. He said, yeah, these idiots ran off into the jungle doing something that they, they couldn't possibly get away with. They overpowered their guards, I don't know, maybe killed them or whatever, and took off and created all kinds of horrible work for me for a week or however long it was, and I finally tracked them down. They're going to be punished severely for this. <clears throat> but for just that short period when they were out there in the jungle, they were soldiers again. They were men. They demanded, with all the force of their being, to be respected. Whereas all you bunch in here who haven't even bothered to escape, I have no respect for you. That's kind of the attitude that says that weaker beings are fair ball, right? And you get my respect by fighting me. Um, you know, the thinking is a Roman aristocrat would never allow himself to become a slave. If he even came close to it, that's it. He, he would open his own veins. There, you've got my dead body. I'm not going to become your slave. But other people would allow themselves to be enslaved. And as, a, as, a, as such, they would get no respect from other Romans. It's why should, I, why should I respect somebody who hasn't killed himself? He's allowed himself to become a slave. He's garbage. And like Lumpet, the Romans lived and died by this, the same as the Japanese and Seppuku. I won't let that happen to me. I will die before I will let that happen to me. Other people won't. Therefore, they get less respect than people who will die. I don't respect the sheep because it lets me kill it, but I do respect the wolverine because it doesn't. Until it's actually dead, it will resist me. Even if it can't possibly win, it will continue to fight until it's dead. Um, that's the mindset behind it. Now, that is a mindset that kind of doesn't allow for things like love because it overlooks the fact, and this is dealt with in Rome as well, a lot of Romans loved their slaves, or at least some of their slaves, and felt loyal towards them. And the slaves, of course, reciprocated. The obvious example of that is um, Cicero and Tyro. Tyro was Cicero's slave, but he might as well have been his son. He was utterly devoted to him, would have killed for him, and didn't want to live after his master had died. And, you know, a Roman might say, oh yes, that's kind of what a proper slave should do because he doesn't really have an existence of his own, um, that once his master is dead, and you saw this when Servilia's slave killed herself after Servilia committed suicide. That's what a slave should do. 
But it's not so much a slave is doing this out of a sense of duty. If the bond is correct and the two love each other, then the um, then the slave really the, the most loving thing it can do is its life. His, the slave's life is now over because the master is dead, etc. Love. What role does love have in our taboos? As I said, if you try to engage me in a, in, a, in a similar conversation that I'm trying to have about the ritual slaughter of animals, um, but instead of the, that subject, we said we're going to talk about rape, I would kind of have a rough time engaging in that because the responses in me would be visceral. And, but they'd be visceral in a way that I wouldn't really be aware of how it was happening because when, when you get a visceral response, you kind of go all over the place without realizing it. And you don't really realize where you're going. Again, you've lost control of yourself, right? You've lost control of the situation. You don't really understand why you're opposed to something, but you are adamantly opposed to it. Um, again, rape. I think most people feel that way. Um, we're just opposed to it because we're opposed to it because we're opposed to it, and we don't want to explore why. And the only real rational or the only real argument we can come up with is it's just horrible and you're violating somebody else's rights. Well, how about I love this person and I don't want this person to be raped because I don't want this person to suffer. Um, and I don't want them to suffer not because watching them suffer makes me angry. I don't want them to suffer because I just, I love them and that which I love, I do not want to suffer. But again, love is a sublogical thing. It's an intuitive thing. And you can't really bring it into rational arguments. In fact, love is often deliberately excluded from rational arguments because, again, love is not really necessarily rational. People will say that it improves our survive survivability, but, again, that just assumes that staying alive is, is an end in itself, which I don't believe it is. Um, I would say that love is an end in itself. We want to exist because only that which exists can feel love, and love is the best state to be in, I would assume. And it is a state of being, right? It's not just a, an emotion. Love is something that conquers you utterly, right? And if I have cultivated loving kindness towards other things, the whole issue of all of our taboos, of slaughtering animals, of violence, rape, whatever, none of that even arises. It just, it obviates it. It just can't begin in a, in a mind that has been um, self-disciplined, in a sense, towards loving kindness. It doesn't arise. But again, our over-reliance on reason prevents this. How do you make a rational case for love as a primary motivation for anything you do? very hard. We're not there yet as, I don't know, a society? Or will we ever be there? That's hard to say, right? But I think that it's a lot more of a secure and solid foundation for our ethics than aversions. Um, you know, you, say the, you see the PETA types. It's all based on anger and it's all based on... Um, anathematizing things and not wanting to discuss any competitive sort of set of values. But you bring love into it. I love animals. Maybe it would be better if you loved animals too. Or maybe I'll explain to you why I don't do these things to animals because I love them. And my example will, will show you that I'm in a better state than you're in when you slaughter them all the time. I would say that that's probably a far more solid and secure foundation for our ethics than just simple aversions and worry, worry about violating some other being's rights. Um, see a cat there. So you can't really see him sleeping there, but there. There he is sleeping over in the corner. He's utterly in my power. He couldn't stop me from being cruel to him, but I, I never do. Why? Because I love my cat. Um... It just doesn't even arise. It's, I don't respect his rights not to be harmed. I just don't want to. I, 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 I want to hold him in my arms and feel him purr. Um, isn't that a better basis for our ethics? 
Um, and isn't that a be better solution for ethical dilemmas rather than just outlawing things, anathematizing things, denouncing things and saying that's horrible, that's terrible, that's unacceptable and we won't even go there? I'd say that it is. But it kind of, again, you're still, you're taking the terror out of it and we are afraid of taking the terror out of these things. Again, you try and have a discussion about Okay, let's discuss rape and why we shouldn't really be opposed to it. What? Are you, what are you talking about? People will just shut you out. I'd be the first one to do that. But how about this? Well, we don't... Why would you want to rape somebody? What they have to offer you is not to be seized like this. What they have to offer you is to be given freely or you're simply to bask in your love. Again, it's a tall order, right? And I don't think most people can live by this, but I think that it can be done on, a, on an individual basis. Why do you not do horrible things? Do you not do horrible things because of guilt, because of horror, because of anathematizing, because of this sort of thing? Or you opt consciously not to do them out of love, loving kindness? the end result would be the same. Your, your, own, your own behavior wouldn't be any different from anyone else's. But what would, I presume, be different is you wouldn't walk around in a rage against the world all the time. Um, rage is no less irrational or intuitive than love is. But you notice how we do actually sort of justify rage in our ethics. We justify righteous indignation. We justify moral outrage. Um, we justify things like being fed up, being sick and tired of this crap. And not doing things or doing things because of love, we kind of go, you know, yeah, sure. The world isn't like that, I'm sorry. We can't just sit here and clap kumbaya and expect everything to be wonderful. Not suggesting that. How about each of us as individuals opt to follow the same moral and ethical code that we've all lived by all of our lives in a sort of visceral way, but we do so for different reasons. Rather than fear, anathematizing, hate, anger, horror, we use love as our motivation. In many ways, this is just one of the oldest arguments that there is. But in many ways, we're less and less attentive to it as anger sort of tends to inform a lot more of our discourse or horror. Um, I bet a lot of people are still in a state of psychological and moral shock from the issue of gay marriage. Uh, to me, it's a done deal. I couldn't care less now. Well, I, no, I, it's not that I couldn't care less. I'm glad that we've, we've brought the homosexual lifestyle into the mainstream of our culture by saying, yes, and this is, I would say, long overdue. Not because it's their right to do this, but because I want for everybody what I've got in my life. Why shouldn't I? Why would I want to deny this person this wonderful thing? Because people who are, lo are, are in a loving, secure relationship with somebody else and sanctioned by society are far less likely to cause trouble in society and they're far more pleasant to be around and far more of an asset, an enhancement to general human society than just saying, oh, well, you have the right to do it, even though I'm still revolted by it and I still hate you, really. But yeah, you have the right to do it. It's still disgusting, but, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, that, that, to me, is not really a healthy way to sort of allow things to take place. You're sort of accepting it grudgingly in your own, I would say, heart of hearts. How about you choose to offer that which you believe that you've already got or that you want to other people? You want, you want love to inform what you are, allow it to inform what others are. And gay marriage would simply be part of that. Um, again, taboos may have their place in society. Um, visceral emotional, intuitive, non-rational conviction may be just as much, just as human as rational conviction. 
perhaps more so even, I don't know. But again, you're loosening the shackles. You're loosening the sort of absolutes on there. You're saying that instead of forcing people, in a sense, through coercion, which is what fear and guilt and hate and anger are, you're saying, no, here are the circumstances under which you would almost certainly choose not to do these things, even if you could. I have the option of walking over there and being cruel to that cat once I turn this camera off and nothing, nobody can stop me from doing it. I don't do it because I love him. Of course I wouldn't do that. I want, it, it makes me feel good to see him sleeping over there. Um, you know, and I presume he has some sort of attachment to me, although I don't know, but it looks like he does. That's far more healthy a relationship than I don't have the right to do that to him, if you ask me, or that it's, that, you know, the thought of being cruel to him is just such an abomination that I, that I, you know, I, I become disgusted with myself just by considering it. Isn't it simpler to just face the fact that I love my cat? Isn't it simpler to just face the fact that perhaps cultivating loving kindness might be a far better um, and far more solid um, foundation for our ethics than aversion and taboo? This is where I was going. And this is where I, you know, this is where I would sort of say, I don't even... The whole idea of sacrificing goats and Kaligat doesn't even come up. Um, I don't want to do that to goats. Um, I want goats to sort of have a nice little goat life. Um, and again, that's not something I can promote to anybody, but that's something I can certainly live by myself. And I would say that it's a lot healthier than aversion. Aversion is when you see the righteous indignation, the angry person who is just permanently pissed off with the world. I'd say that person really isn't has a serious problem with their ethics. Their ethics are based purely on denunciation of something, anathematization, that sort of thing. Um, too much reason, perhaps? and too much frustration with the unreason that seems to be inherent in human beings.